So as you said, we're about to enter the male snake dungeon. And I can tell it's, it's dark in there already. Yeah, yeah, it's very dark. And the smell is already coming out. Yeah. I mean, anybody watching this, I don't think you will understand. The stench is like going somewhere where it's musty. Yeah. And I, I want to cover my nose right now. We that's, haven't even entered. That's, that's how it is. And to imagine, that's how it is. You know, tell us a little bit about you know, the numbers of people that were held down. Okay, so watch your head. Um, I have to watch my head. Yeah, you have to watch your head. You know, you're, you're, you're a total lady. So. All right, so uh, we are now entering the male dungeon. And first things first, I want you all to know that the floor we are walking on is not the original floor of the dungeon. Oh, it's not? It's not the original floor because there came a time when the trade was almost over, the Europeans had decided we will stop cleaning. So all these slave traders will have domestic captives who are Africans mm -hmm. come in here instead of cleaning, cover everything up with sand, okay. and they'll bring African men and women to go back and sleep on top of it. You're joking. And at that time, everything was so high that when people walked through the dungeons, it was up to their uncle level. But now it's so solid on the floor that when you walk on it, it feels like you're walking on a very normal floor. Wait, wait, wait. What were they walking on in their ankles? I would say DNA of Africans. Feces, urine, food particles, all of that mixed up. That's, that's what they had to walk on. That's disgusting. And sleep on. Disgusting. Exactly. So feces, urine, all of that. People's sweat, feces, people's, everything. People's bodies. All of that, people yeah. People have died. Exactly. And you know, whenever the people died, they were not even buried. So we're walking on a, a ground that's like a mixture of all of All kinds of stuff. And if you take a bit of the soil, you test it, all these things I've talked about, you find it there. Right, so let's come down. Let's see more. What you just said is sickening. Yeah, very. Sickening. Very. Oh, I see a very small window back there. How many people were kept in here? Well, there were 1,000 men that stayed in the built dungeon in general. 1,000? 1,000. And if you look up in that hole, you see there happens to be the only source of ventilation and light for this very room. This is nasty. And this is the second room. This is nasty. Very. This is the second room. The first room is on the other side, and then we have a third, fourth, and fifth rooms on the other side too. So it's a huge space. But then I'll talk first of all in the first room. Yeah, I was just going to ask yes. why so this room. Yeah, that's funny. Okay. It looks like there's a little, um, uh, I don't know, like a. Yeah. This is made this, for. This is actually a trench for every liquid waste to run through all the way into the sea. And as I told you, the floor we walked on is covered up with waste. It was the same here, but this site was excavated in the year 1974 by the archaeological department from the University of Ghana. Okay, so that's an update. Exactly. So for everybody to know that indeed the floors were constructed like this, but it's covered up. And afterwards, they even left a portion in this room for everybody that comes here to know that this whole floor was covered up, but they took it off. Okay. And this is the portion right here. Okay, so that's okay. So you see the difference of exactly. what it looks like with all of the of the waste covering the waste it up. and the matter. Uh huh. And then this is when it's cleaned up. Exactly. So you can see what's underneath. Exactly. There. So, let me tell you a little more about the dungeons and the Astadia. You know, 1,000 African men staying down here, they have wooden buckets placed around. Wooden buckets? Yes, so they will have to go and defecate in it. So but they then, themselves have to carry the bucket somewhere? Well, they had domestic captains who carried the bucket and threw everything into the sea and cleaned the force up. But then majority of these captives were never able to get to the buckets because they were having diarrhea, malaria fever, and other diseases. Just because they were in shackles and chains, movement was slowed down by that. You know, population slowed movements down, and they fed them twice a day. But then you will have to eat in your palm, which will not be washed. 
And the reason why they were not washing their palm is you're going to be staying here at least two weeks or three months without a single shower. Sometimes it gets so hot in there that they have to splash water on them, but then that is going to cool them down. So splashing water on people doesn't mean you're washing them up. And the food they ate was just to keep them going, not something to satisfy anybody. That is why when they were found, sometimes they found some of them dead here. They just can't pick the dead bodies and they toss them into the sea. And they don't just throw them into the sea because the next day you're going to see the body lying on the shore. So they will tie it up with a common ball and drop it so it sinks. And because of the darkness here, anytime the two people out there, they went in passion blind. They couldn't see very well. It's just pure evil. It's just pure evil. People can even do that to other people. Exactly. You have to watch your head. So we are done with the first room. We go to the second room. But then we'll make this talk that we talk to be there when we talk about uh, what we saw from our neighbors in the church, if you remember. Yes, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> There's a third one. Okay. Also the same floor? Yes, the, the same the floor. And sometimes the floor becomes very slippery. Most of the times when rain falls. Because the dungeons are created in such a way that when rain falls, the rain water will enter the dungeon and wash the place up and cool the place down. That's how it was That's how it's built. Done. Yes. So if you take a look up there, right up there, yes. you see a hole over there. Yes, that is the very hole we saw from at the entrance of the church above the dungeon. Oh. Church of England. Oh. Oh, and you hear the sound. Exactly. So you are here, you hear the sound. Everything. And then that's what you were saying about these exactly. chambers and the echoes through the yeah, chambers. Yeah, echoes through the chambers. So everybody hears everybody hears them worshiping on top. Just to sensitize them. Wow. Because they are going to convert them into becoming Christians on the other side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, this is good. Yeah, so this is the fourth one. It's very emotional. This is the fourth one. Yeah. And that's the last room with the shrine. So this shrine was added up and well, the shrine, I would say, was on this land originally before the Europeans themselves arrived. Okay. You know, before the Europeans arrived in Africa, Africans had Christianity and African traditional religion. They had Christianity? Yes, I would say they had Christianity because of the Israelites and all of that. Okay. Yes. So then, African traditional religion is where Africans believe in the existence of the Almighty God by worshiping three lesser gods. Believe in the spirit of these gods live in things of nature. So it's a bit similar to that of what the Native Americans were practicing. So the shrine was here, but then when the Portuguese arrived here and the chiefs gave the land to them, they were paying rent to the chiefs. That's why there came a time they had to ask the chief to take the shrine away from here. Like the Portuguese were paying rent to the chiefs? The Portuguese were paying rent to them. While the British were here, they were also paying rent to them. The Swedes were paying rent to them. So they all received money from the chiefs. So the chief... From the European, sorry. So this, is, so this is part of what a lot of people have trouble with. Exactly. The whole story of Africans being partially involved in the transatlantic slave trade and some people feeling that Africans are at fault, and some say no, they were forced. And, um, but you're telling us about the chiefs taking rent from exactly. these people, so yeah. just go into more detail about Okay, that. so um, if you look at the transatlantic slave trade itself, it wouldn't have happened for about 400 years on the continent of Africa if not African, if there was no African involvement. Well, when the Europeans came, there were raiding markets because the Arabs had already been to Africa to do trans-Saharan slave trade. So then the Europeans saw that the market was there. That is why they started talking to the Africans about it. And Africans they talked about were tribal leaders as well as wealthy and influential Africans. They even sometimes made acquaintances with them so that it would be easy for them to ask favors for them. So, the Africans brought more Africans to the Europeans than the Europeans getting people by themselves. I'm not saying the Europeans never got people. They went out there, raided villages of its people and all of that. But Africans brought more people to them. 
And the reason why they brought more people to them was there were lots of intertribal wars around here. And any time they brought Africans to the Europeans, the Europeans gave them guns and gunpowder and other things in exchange. But the more guns the tribes were getting, the more powerful they were becoming. If I go out there, fight other tribes, I defeat them, I take their people and their property, which makes me very wealthy. But the people I have taken, most of these men will be given out to the Europeans for them to keep. The women, some of the men in the tribe will marry them, have kids with them, they become part of the system. So that's one thing that happened. So the more wars that broke out, the more people they got, the more they supplied to the Europeans, and the more they also got, the more motivated they became in supplying arms to the local people. That does not mean Africans, some of them never fought against the slave trade. They did. If you talk of Benin, the king in Benin at that time decided, I am no longer going to sell male captives to the Europeans. I am rather going to sell only female captives to them. But then, did the Europeans need more female captives? They needed more male captives, more field hands. So if you need more field hands, and you're not selling me the more field hands, I would rather decide not to buy from you anymore. So then slave trade stopped in Benin. The same happens to Elmina. The Dutch were able to defeat the Portuguese because the people of Elmina around 1637 supported the Dutch to fight the Portuguese from on the sea and on land. But then prior to that, the Dutch had tried twice. They never succeeded. And so the people thought that if I help these Dutch fight the Portuguese, I will then be able to move them out of here for them to stop whatever they were doing here because they had that hatred for them. Mm -hmm. But then thinking that when the Dutch take over, they will not do what the Portuguese were doing. But immediately they took over the Elmina castle. They started expanding the fort. Mm -hmm. And they even fueled everything the more, which means the people went back to zero. So that's what happened. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The story is just. Yeah, but then. You know, but I, I'm 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 quite sure that the people, the chiefs, the people who were, you know, allowing some of their own people to be given to the Europeans didn't realize. Well, originally. The capacity of what was being done. They didn't know exactly what the Europeans were going to do with the people. Mm -hmm. But then later on, mm -hmm. they came to realize it. Mm -hmm. But then you realize that when a person becomes very much addicted to something, it becomes very difficult for them to start to stop. So they were so much deeply rooted into the business that going back to where they started from wasn't an option. Yeah. Sort of like if someone becomes a drug dealer and they say they're only doing two trades. Exactly. Then you get in and you get yeah, in and you get in and you keep going. Like, keep going. You're there. Yeah, there's no going back. So Not this, that I'm comparing drug dealing to yeah, 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 just yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to use a simple exactly, analogy. Exactly. So then this shrine you see here was actually returned here. When Ghana had become Republic after independence, the chiefs came to realize the Europeans had left, they would never go back here. So they decided, then let's bring it back to its original place. Okay. That's why they came back, built this very altar, and brought the stones they took away back here. And it's still an active shrine. It's covered in blood. The blood is not that of a human, but that of animals. They sacrifice you all the time. Yes. And if we take this shrine away, you realize that there is a short, thick wall up here. Mm -hmm. If you look behind the short, thick wall, you realize that there is another wall over there. Mm -hmm. That will be the original construction of the building. Mm -hmm. This one in front is just used to cover up something. And that happens to be an underground tunnel that connected the male dungeon and the door of no return, about 70 meters from here. I see. Okay. Yes. Okay. So all the African men that were supposed to be staying here, whenever the ships came, none of them was allowed to walk out there. Mm -hmm. They forced all of them to go down this way. So they go through the tunnel, all the way down to the door of no return. They would take boats over there. The boats would carry them to the ships, and the ships would take them out of Africa without ever taking them back to the continent of Africa. That is why it says the door of no return. You go out, there's no coming back. And then these are all flowers. These are all wreaths brought in by Africans and European advisors from all over the world, mostly from the United States, Caribbean islands, as well as Europe. They bring them to pay their respect to all of the Africans that went through all these inhumane conditions. Yeah.
I, I feel like I'm speechless, just everything that you've, you've been telling me. I know that everybody watching this will really feel the impact and feel all these stories you're telling about, you know, both sides, uh, about the different yeah. people who've taken over from, yeah. from the British to the Dutch to exactly. uh, Portuguese. Portuguese to the Danes and all of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's go to, where are we going to go? Okay, so this, was, this was the last room. Yeah, this is the, the last room. Dungeon. So from here, I'm taking you straight to the condemned cell. Okay. We're going to see that side, and from there, I'll take you to see um, the female dungeons okay. and the female punishment cell, and then we'll finally talk about the door of no return right, and great. the door of return. Okay. Yes, I know. Yeah. Okay.